So welcome. Uh, this is our uh, accepted students event, open house for the history and the history and secondary education major. Uh, my name is Ian Delahanty. I'm an assistant professor of history. And Tom, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Thomas Carty. I, I'm professor of history, and um, we thank you for taking a few minutes to to watch this program with us. So uh, Ian is our accepted student who's joined us today. So first, uh, we didn't say it, but Ian, congrats on uh, your acceptance. And you know, uh, I'm, I'm still, I think, young enough to know that this is a hard decision to make. And at some point, I'll, I'll forget that that experience. But uh, it's still fresh enough now that I know it's a, you know it's not the easiest decision in the world, especially in these circumstances. So we appreciate you taking the time to learn more about us and you know uh, visit with us today. Um, and for folks that are watching this recording, again, congratulations to you. And we, you know, we hope to hear from you uh, at some point and hopefully see you in the fall. Um, we thought we would just kind of introduce, we have some current students with us today, uh, and then we'll have just a bit of discussion and conversation. And then, you know, Ian, if you have questions, uh, please, please ask. Uh, I've got plenty of questions and Dr. Cardi has plenty of questions to get our current majors talking too. So um, anyways, why don't we have our, our current students introduce themselves. I'll just kind of Carter, you're next to me on the on the Zoom here, so why don't you tell us about yourself? Yeah, sure. So I'm Carter Brochu. I'm a sophomore. I'm a history secondary ed major. I'm from northern Vermont, St. John's, Vermont, about three hours north of here. I'm on the Club Frisbee team here, and I'm also an orientation leader as well for incoming freshmen. Awesome. So you could be, in theory, Ian's orientation leader. Uh, come in the theory, yes, that could yeah. very well happen. How about Sabrina? Do you want to tell us about yourself next? Sure. Uh, my name is Sabrina Moore. I'm from Brooklyn in New York City. Uh, I'm a sophomore history major, just general, but I'm currently minoring in philosophy and public history and museum studies. I'm the vice president of the history club. Um, I'm part of the honors program. And yeah, that's it. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, Molly, and then last but not least, Quinn. Hi, I'm Molly. Um, I'm pretty much the same as Carter. I'm from Vermont. <laughs> I am a history and secondary education major. Um, I'm also part of the new student orientation and um, also honors program here at Springfield College. And I'm Quinn. I'm a senior this year in the history and secondary education major. Uh, normally I'm a part of BLAST, which is an after school program that the school runs where you get to hang out with other students, but I took this semester off because I'm full time teaching. So that's a little stressful, but yeah, that's about it. Oh, I'm from Belchertown, Mass. I don't know if I said that. And I'll, I'll uh, so again, my name's Ian. Uh, so, you know, uh, kindred spirit here with you, Ian, and uh, we, you know, uh, uh, it's a, it's it's uh, always fun to find an, another another Ian in the in the crowd. Uh, I teach American history classes. My area of kind of specialty and research is the Civil War era, and American immigration history. So I teach an upper level class on the Civil War era. I'm teaching one right now on Civil War history. I'm also teaching a new class on Irish history. That's kind of like an experimental class right now that I'm hoping to maybe at some point add to the to the regular offerings. Um, yeah, and Dr. Carter, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us about your research and your, your uh, teaching. Yes, I, thanks. I do more recent U.S. history, but really I've taught just uh, about everything at Springfield College. I've taught a world history class. I've taught international relations. I've taught, um, and then I've taught uh, even a, a course on Harry Potter when some students talked me into it. So, so I, I've really um, sort of tried to make a lot of connections for students with history. And in terms of research, I've, his, I've researched more uh, politics and presidential elections and religion and politics in particular, but recent US history. Oh, I also teach environmental history, which I'm doing this semester. So Ian, you said you're interested in the, the public history and museum studies minor, is that, is that right? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, so I can say a little bit more about it, and then maybe um, you know, Sabrina is relatively early on in it, but she can she can maybe speak to it a, a bit too. Um, so I I am the I guess coordinator for the the minor. Um, I don't know how much you, you've been able to sort of research about it, but uh, it's a, it, I think it's a pretty unique um, program in that you know you don't find a lot of colleges that offer that this type of minor that gives you know looking at history uh, as outside of sort of you know a, a you know, academic discipline, but looking at how it's produced for public 
consumption uh, and how that happens in museums and, and other sort of public history venues. Um, the, I think you know, a couple highlights about the minor is that one uh, is a class called History 201, Making History Public, which Molly and Quinn, Quinn, you did that one. Is that correct, right? Do you want to say a little bit about your experience in that class and, and you know, any ways in which it's a, a more, you know, a kind of distinctive class? Yeah, so I loved History 201. We got to like learn more about not just like the history of the school, but also the history of the area. And we got to do like hands-on experience learning about um, like actually going through artifacts and we did like interviews and we met with people involved in like the we did like the um, civil rights movements on campus in the late 60s early 70s and got to like build relationships I actually just emailed the guy that I interviewed the other day and we're going to meet up and have like a picnic or something soon so I'm very excited it was probably definitely one of my favorite classes yeah, I think that was just an incredible class because of just how into history you got to be. It was like you were in the archives, you were understanding the different material. And while unfortunately, when my uh, the person that I interviewed passed away, um, it was really incredible getting that experience to talk to a former dean of Springfield College at that time and just getting his like testimony and his experience and to have that now in our archives is just a crazy, awesome memory. And so, Ian, the, the class um, kind of culminates with creating a, a new exhibit for our college museum, which we actually didn't get to do with Quinn and Molly because kind of an exciting opportunity in the fall is that in the next academic year, actually, we're running a grant in which uh, myself, our college archivist, and then some student researchers will be working with a museum in the city of Springfield to create a new exhibit about this, this uh, Black student protest that took place on campus in, this, in the late 60s, early 70s and how they were connected to kind of civil rights activism in the city of Springfield at that time. Um, so it's, it's a cool class because it, again, it's more like as Molly and Quinn said, like hands-on in the archive, and then ultimately thinking about, well, how would you kind of tell this story, not to like a professor, but like to someone visiting a museum or, or just kind of, you know, an interested member of the public. Um, and then the other part of the minor is that it requires an internship. And so a lot of our students have interned at, um, in the college archives itself, we've had a couple other students go to local area museums as well. So Sabrina will be looking at that prospect in the next uh, year or two. Um, but then Dr. Cardi, you also oversee the, the pre-law um, uh, program as well. So maybe you wanna say a little bit more about that. Great, yeah, thanks. So the pre-law program is, is really, in the last few years has really uh, taken off and that we've had a lot of students have an in take an interest in a few of our programs. One of them is a three plus three accelerated program. So you do three years at Springfield College and you do three years at Western New England University. So this is a great opportunity to cut down on financial costs and cut down on the years you're gonna to dedicate to, to um, your bachelor's degree and your JD or your Juris Doctor, your, your law degree in six years rather than, than the, the seven years it would normally take, the, the four plus three. So you can still do it that way, a four plus three, if you're interested in law school. And we've had students in recent years do both. We've had a couple of students uh, go to law school at different places like University of New Hampshire, uh, University of Albany, uh, years ago, Michigan State University. So we've had, we've had students go to law school in many different places. Uh, but this three plus three is a unique program that, that accelerates you and gets you through um, in a quicker period of time. And I think uh, the history major matches up well with this program because history, as the students can tell you, you do a lot of reading, you do a lot of writing, you do a lot of uh, analysis, putting yourself in the position of somebody else from years ago, from different cultures and different times in history. So I think it's a good match and um, we have had some history majors do this. Um, maybe I was thinking if Sabrina, you wanted to talk a little bit about, I know you're not interested in law school, but you, you have a philosophy minor. And I think that's another area where, as we've had uh, people come to Springfield College and talk about um, University of Massachusetts professor, for example, came, he said, the tools of a lawyer are words, just like you know, the carpenter has a hammer and, and uh, his toolbox, but the words are the tools of a lawyer. And I think with history, and a few of our students um, have done a history, um, for, history major and a philosophy minor, I think that's a good combination. So if you don't mind, Sabrina, I know I put you on the spot with this one, but what, can you tell me a little bit about, or tell us a little bit about what you've, what you've done in your 
philosophy classes as well as your history classes? Um, so for my philosophy classes, um, for like the first, sorry, the first three semesters, I had the same professor, Professor um, Gr Gruber, who is like amazing, wonderful. You should totally take him. He's awesome um, at his job. And I took a lot of like upper level classes. So like my spring semester, my freshman year, I took a level 300 class on existentialism. And really through those classes, I just learned how to argue better. And that's kind of, as you said, like you, your toolbox is your words. And that really, being in that class really helped me develop that. And it helped me, and so as a history major, you also have to write a lot of papers and essays. And also with philosophy, you have to write a lot of papers and essays. And so having that ability to be able to kind of articulate yourself a lot better um, and kind of get straight to the point and as I said before arguing is really great when you have to do these type of historical essays and you have to look at you have to re oh sorry you have to like research and <laughs> I don't know yeah, I mean, to write and to say right <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly um, but yeah that's kind of how the philosophy and history philosophy minor and the history major kind of just worked really well for me um, in the sense of just writing. Thanks. Yeah, and I think, you know, the history secondary ed, like Carter, Molly, and Quinn, right, you've got really packed schedules and, you know, there, there's not a ton of room for extra classes, but Ian, for someone who's just a history major, there's a lot of room, not just for an additional minor, uh, a lot of our history majors who aren't in education will also add, you know, two minors, sometimes double major and a minor. So you could certainly take up like the history major and public history minor, but also add another minor, another major perhaps, like I have another advisee, she's also in the public history minor. She actually just added a second major in digital web and multimedia uh, design because she's looking at that as a kind of particular set of, you know, skills that she can bring into, you know, the, the kind of museum field going forward. So uh, it's, it's a good major in that it's, it has a lot of flexibility built in, uh, the straight history major. Um, I think that's kind of like the, 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 well, Tom, did you want to add on something? Thanks. Yeah, I thought um, if Quinn, you could bring in a couple of thoughts here, because one is the, you talk about the MTELs and how, how we worked a little bit on the MTELs. Um, the, if you are a history secondary ed major, that would be a great, um, a great link that you could explain to students how the education department and the history department or the history program work together. And then maybe you and Molly might want to talk about study abroad opportunities also. Absolutely. I'll talk about both. Love it. Um, so with history and the MTELs and everything, Dr. Cardi was the absolutely a, a savior over the summer. I took my I history. I wasn't asking for compliments. <laughs> <laughs> no, ab absolutely helped me. Um, the There's a, like two major tests you have to take. So you have to take like the literacy, like reading and writing test, which is just like a standard everyone has to take. And then there's like a content one. So it's history content and it's everything. So everything history, everything politics, everything geography, also everything economics, like everything. And so it just like overwhelming to look at, but Dr. Hardy really helped me like sat down with me and another student over the summer. And we just like looked over at everything and we would go like meet once a week and just talk about like four or five major topics, go over like questions that we had. And then I remember the night before the test, I had like eight, five by eight, like note cards of like essay outlines. And I was like, what am I missing? Like, what do I need to know? And I just like went over with him and it was honestly made me feel a lot less stressed and so much better. And then I passed on the first one. Like I passed the first time. I was like, I'm not doing this again. I don't want to sit down and take it too much stress, but it was honestly so helpful. And I just felt like a huge stress off my shoulders, having those like weekly meetings with Dr. Cardi and it just made me feel a whole lot better. Um, you would have been fine, Quinn, but it is good that, that we, that is, we're a small program, so we know each other, we're able to meet and just, uh, you know, keep, keep the stress level down, <laughs> I think was, was, was great. So thanks, but thank you for, for cooperating because we want you all to succeed. And how about study abroad for Molly and Quinn? You both, you know, even with those really tight schedules, you've both been able to, to you know, manage to do a study abroad, some really cool places. You can tell Ian and other folks kind of tuning in what, where you went and, you know, how, what your experience was. Um, you want to go first, Molly? I just want to put in a plug for any out-of-staters for 
what mtels are because i came in here and i was like sorry i don't know what's happening <laughs> um vermont does not train you for massachusetts frameworks um but just as like a general idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about mtels um to become a teacher you need to take some tests and those are what mtels are in massachusetts uh, as Quinn said, we take two, one's content-based in history, um, and one is kind of general, like the fun literature side of the SAT. So that is really what's helpful to getting into like further pre-practicums and getting into schools, just knowing that you have that like base level of information. But for yeah. study abroad, I went to- Let me, let me follow up. Oh yeah. Sorry, Molly. Let me follow up on that. Yeah, thanks for- for telling us, yeah, we have to explain MTEL because that's a Massachusetts teaching and licensure, licensure test. And I just want to add one thing to that, Molly, before you study abroad is it's a tough test. Massachusetts has the toughest test, right? Um, you hear people from other states and they say the test is not as hard. Uh, the good news is, is that other states recognize how hard the test is and they, and they accept the, the Massachusetts test. Uh, and also it, it really prepares you for, um, for, for teaching, I think. So yeah, thanks. For Molly, for, for asking that question, what is the MTEL? And uh, and um, if you have any other questions, Ian, you know, feel free. But go ahead, Molly, on study abroad. Yeah. So um, for study abroad, I Ian, you met me in fall of 2019. So I was probably like freaking out about going to New Zealand, right? I don't know if I mentioned that to you at all, but yeah. So that kind of got shut down when the world got shut down. Um, but I had an amazing month and a half. In New Zealand um, and then from there I went home and I got to take zoom classes at 1 a.m. and I was having a great time it was amazing um, it was just such a great opportunity to both go abroad to understand how simply it was done through Springfield I was worried I was gonna have to like be doing all of this paperwork all of this visa filing by myself but just knowing the support system that Springfield College study abroad programs have was incredible and I cannot recommend it enough. Even my one and a half months, I mean, Quinn got the full experience, but I would, I would go back to those 1 a.m. Zoom calls in a heartbeat, so. I studied abroad in Galway, Ireland, which is on the West Coast, which is the best coast of Ireland. Um, so I studied abroad in Galway and it was absolutely the highlight of my college career. I was actually on Zoom last night with the friends that I met there. Some of them live in Kansas. Um, it was absolutely amazing. I definitely recommend. I think I traveled to 12 other countries when I was in Europe because it was like a two hour bus ride to the airport. So we would leave at like 2 a.m., get to the airport at four, catch a flight at five, and then end up at like Italy in a couple hours. It was absolutely amazing. I definitely recommend you learn so many like important skills, not just like about yourself and like how to manage in life, but also like his, as a history major amazing. I went to the Colosseum. I climbed the Acropolis in Greece. I did, oh my gosh, what else did I do? I went to Loch Ness and looked for the Loch Ness Monster, but it was January, so sleeping. But it was absolutely amazing. I definitely recommend that experience. I loved going through Europe because I wanted to see as much as possible in that short amount of time, but absolutely amazing. 12 out of 10 would recommend. I didn't know that Nessie hibernated. I'll have to, my, my, Kids are studying hibernation right now, so I'll have to remind them that Messi also hibernates. I like to think that's why I didn't see her. <laughs> it could, yes, yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, you know, with, obviously the study abroad is a wonderful opportunity. There's also a ton of stuff to do on campus and kind of like, you know, in, in the, the local area, right? So, Carter, you mentioned that you're uh, disc club Frisbee, right? Can you say a little bit more about either that or just kind of generally what campus life is like aside, you know, outside the classroom maybe? Yeah, so that's that's something that kind of drew me to Springfield too was the amount it has to offer outside of the classroom as well, uh, and that's something that like this college does a good job of forefronting at the front. And so one of the clubs I joined was the club frisbee team. It's just a bunch of people get together two nights a week and we play some frisbee for two hours. We'll play some games once COVID's over, but that's something that I do. And there's all sorts of other clubs. I know other people like Sabrina says she's part of the history club. Uh, there's clubs pretty much for anything and everything and if not you can always get a group of people together and uh, create a new club and then outside of clubs too there's always stuff to be done athletically or even just hanging out with friends and that's what's so nice too about the campus is just so welcoming there's always places to go hubs to be such as like the union or the library or the dining hall you can always just kind of go with people 
and have a good time no matter where you go. And I think that that's something that Springfield does so well too, outside of uh, the classwork side of school. So, uh, Ian, did you have any particular questions for us? I mean, we've you know talked at you a lot, and you're right in the middle of my my Zoom screen, so I feel like we've kind of surrounded you and, and put you on the on the on the spot here. But let us know. Have any questions, or what kind of? I'm interested. What what areas of history are you kind of interested in? Are you are you curious about, or would you want to take classes in? Um, I'm mostly interested in stuff from like a little about like 1850 onwards. Cause that's when like history really started to pick up because there was like the civil war then the industrial revolution and then turn of the century a lot of changes we go from an article saying man will fly for a million years to a plane flying just a few days later uh, and just the modern kind of era the transition into modernity yeah also i had some questions for um miss moore about the internship opportunities within the uh his, uh, sorry, the museum studies minor. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that, please? Uh, sure. I don't really know that much yet because um, the way I've calculated it, because I've been like trying to figure out like what classes I have to take. Um, so the internship opportunity comes my senior year, like the fall semester of my senior year. So I can't really around that time. So I can't really say much about it. Um, but I am like, you can always do like work study things that kind of go towards um, the kind of um, career that you wanna do. So for me, I wanna be an archivist. So I had the lucky opportunity to now um, work with the head archivist and now I'm like an archives assistant in the museum at the college. And so that's another way you always have to do internships. You can always, you know, look for work study opportunities with, um, professors and faculty, and that's a whole other way to get experience. I will also say that um, when I came in as a freshman, I joined History Club, and one of my friends in History Club uh, was named Hogan, and he was in both kind of, in a, he was in a museum, so like he worked in a museum, he had the opportunity to go learn how to curate um, and he was like super nerdy about that and it was just having a great time. So I'm sure like a lot of that process hasn't changed, maybe a little bit with a pandemic, but I remember him just coming in and being like, guess what? I got to set up like a new museum like creation today. And I was like, that's awesome. So. So Ian and, and Sabrina too, uh, this is actually one of the things we'll talk about in advising in a couple of weeks, but um, typically for the minor, you would you do the internship after you take this history 201 class, making history public. Just the way that it works, it's, you know, the, the class gets you introduced to working in an archive, to, you know, visiting, we, you know, fingers crossed, we will be visiting museums this fall uh, to get a sense of, you know, what does an exhibit look like? What are the different types of, of ways in which uh, an exhibit engages a, a public audience? Um, and then after you take that class, you're kind of positioned to, and it doesn't have to be your senior year at all. So Sabrina, I'll actually be talking with you about maybe doing an internship next year. Um, either in our archives or as Molly pointed out, we have a really good relationship with the Springfield Museums, which are actually a collection of six different museums in downtown Springfield. Um, have you been there at all, Ian, the Springfield Museums? Yeah, I very much frequented them as a young okay. kid. So My favorite is probably the Springfield History Museum, like the one across the street, just because of like, it fits into that kind of Gilded Age modernity period I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah, so that's actually where this exhibit we're creating for, through the grant program is going to be installed for, for I think, about three or four months uh, sometime in, this, in 2022. Um, but we've also, like Dr. Carter and I have talked with folks from the Springfield Armory National Historic Site, and they've expressed, you know, an openness to having interns there as well. Um, and so there's a, a, you know, a number of different opportunities, and certainly you could do more than one internship. I think uh, we had a student that graduated last year as a learn who started with an internship in our college archives before going back and doing one in uh, at the Brooklyn Art Museum, I think it was, because she's from Brooklyn and was, and was there uh, over the summer and was able to sort of swing it that way. So there's a lot of different opportunities for doing that. But, you know, start with a class, you know, progress on to like a more local one. And then from there, you know, who knows? Um, good. Yeah, Tom. I want to add a couple of uh, ideas to that. Of course, New England, again, as Molly reminds us, not everybody may be from New England, is that New England's full of museums, national park sites, and not national park sites like out west where it might be 
uh, Yellowstone National Park or Yosemite, but historical parks. Um, and so that's, this is kind of a, a, a special opportunity that, that we have to, to connect you with the National Park Services, which has a, a career path of its own, if, if you're considering that. Um, and uh, yeah, in my environmental history class, the National Park Rangers have always come and spoken to my classes, which they'll continue to do on you know, this time through uh, teleconference. But so there, there we have, a, that's one reason we started this public history program, knowing that we have some treasures here in terms of museums in, in Massachusetts and New England. Yeah. And along those lines, you know, I think um, certainly my class is like my Civil War class is one of the required classes for the public history minor because we do a lot of we do a lot of field trips to local historical sites and also sort of sites of public history. So this, the Wood Museum, um, but also like a, a local cemetery where there's a lot of Civil War soldiers that are buried. Um, Sabrina and, and Carter missed out on this experience last spring, but we typically would go to Boston and do a walking tour of uh, Civil War monuments there and sort of think about how public commemoration uh, sort of intersects with contemporary discussions about race and the, you know, sort of Confederate monuments uh, discussion. So um, whether it's in that class, and I think, you know, Dr. Cardi does a couple of his own field trips as well. We'd like to try to, as much as possible, get, you know, get out of the classroom and, and go to, again, this really wealth of, of local sites and resources that we have available to us. Um, oh, <laughs> great, you took your, your, your friend on that tour, huh? Uh, did you have, <laughs> I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that another time. That must be a, a really good friend. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Ian, if you have other questions, uh, please ask us or Tom, you want to jump in? Thanks. Yeah, I just want to add there, we also have a, a third professor who's on sabbatical this year, but Professor Gonzalez de Leon, Fernando Gonzalez de Leon, who does European history, uh, ancient and classical history. And he's even taught uh, classes on pirates in the past, he's given Halloween lectures about uh, ghosts and vampires, uh, and he's taken students far afield, I think, to Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. Uh, several years ago for the History Club. So that's something maybe to aspire to if there are some students out there that want to think about really uh, bigger field trips in the future once, once we have that opportunity. Um, that you can find uh, his profile online. And um, I don't know if any of you, I'm sure some of you have taken classes with, with him. I'm not sure if you took the pirates class or not, but, but he's, he's a third professor that we have. Yeah. Well, Ian, if you have any more questions, let us know. And, and Carter, Sabrina, Quinn, Molly, if there's something we, you think we've missed, feel free to let us know. Anything, not just about the history program, but about the college too, that you would want to add in, you know, for someone thinking about this. Um, you know, a student perspective is, is what we're looking for here. So let us know. Any other questions for yourself, Ian? Um, so for those of you who like aren't from the area, like how well have you adjusted? Because I mean, yeah. college at times can be a new thing, I'd imagine, like you're in a new area. Yeah, so for me, especially, I kind of, I'm sure Molly can agree with this. We both come from very rural parts of Vermont. This is like, the city of Springfield is bigger than any area in Vermont. So coming here, living here and trying to figure out, you know, city life and having all of that uh, accessibility is something you kind of uh, get used to very fast. Even somebody from you like East Longmeadow coming to Springfield, you kind of pick up on the college way of living pretty fast. You know, you're interacting with uh, people that you go to classes with all day and then even all night as well. So you kind of pick up what everybody else is kind of doing and then figure out, you know, what best works for you, what best doesn't work for you. And so I think someone like for me that came from a very rural area to uh, an area like Springfield was, uh, it took me a little bit to pick up, you know, uh, the city area at first, and, you know, how to go day to day. But, you know, month in, I was figuring things out day to day and was able to figure things out on my own, which was nice. I think also, as I can definitely agree with Carter, I mean, my my elementary graduating class was 40 people. So pretty big numbers for Vermont. Um, but I think overall coming here, the nice part about it is that no matter who you are, like even if your stomping grounds is East Longmeadow, like Springfield's still confusing to everyone. <laughs> and like on top of that, like college is still crazy for everyone. So like getting adjusted is really a group effort. And sure, I still like scream at my GPS when it brings me down the other wrong road in Springfield because I'm just, I'm lost, but I'll get there eventually. And I think it's just a fun learning experience for everyone. 
Sabrina, you've had the other experience coming from the big city, right? Yeah. Um, so, so my thing is that like, so I come from Brooklyn. I like crossed the bridge from Manhattan. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm part of this big city. So when I came to Springfield, I didn't really consider it a city in a sense because of the way of how I know cities. I thought of it as like a, like a town at most. <laughs> and so it wasn't really hard to really kind of get adjusted at most. Like what I would say, it's very quiet, um, which is kind of a problem for me because I've always grown up with noise like everywhere. So I was I had to get accustomed to that as well. But as Molly said, like it's very much of a group effort. And as you have like the right support system, whether that be, you know, faculty, professors, or just like your roommate and like friends that you make through, you know, clubs and through classes, that can really make a difference and really help you kind of and a set a foundation that you can like build on and feel more comfortable here. So that's kind of what I would say. Yeah, I, would I just will say that on question. like, oh, sorry, Professor Cardi. No. I was just gonna say that like on behalf of coming from the area, like East Long Meadow, I'm from Belchertown, like 20 minutes away, you know, like at first I was nervous. I was like, oh my God, my mom works in Springfield. Like she's gonna come by every day. And that's not the case, right? Um, I go home exactly as often as I want to go home and I like you do feel like you don't feel like you're living at home or that you're too close like you do have like a whole it is a whole new experience you know because I was a little worried like is it going to be the same but I actually saw like I loved being like 30 minutes from my home because if I needed to the option was there I could still work at my job from high school every weekend or during the weeks if I wanted to pick up extra cash like you don't really feel like you're stuck living at home if like you move on campus like it is a totally different experience and you do you don't like really miss out on the college experience if going this close from home i was just going to add that uh, i think one thing we haven't said directly but we're a small program i think as you can sort of see we develop a relationship with students that we're comfortable with students i think they're comfortable with us um, I, I was just thinking as Sabrina was talking, I used to, uh, she, I used to like when she used to drop in on me like four o'clock on a Tuesday or Thursday afternoon, you know, our doors are open, our offices doors are open. And um, so I think that's, that's particularly kind of special about our program as well. Yeah, I definitely agree that the smaller program has a lot of benefits, mainly like if I need to schedule a advisory meeting I can just wait after class and just talk to my advisor so like it's really easy to navigate what seems to be those like first stressful parts of like oh my gosh how do I get classes well they're just it's super easy and people just want to help yeah I think that's true across like the college as a whole like even outside you know everywhere in the college right it, it's a really uh it, like Molly, very enthusiastic and and just sort of a you know warm sort of embracing place. You know um, that's that's been my impression and having been here six years now, and I'm sure Dr. Cardi would agree. I've been here uh, a little bit longer, right, Tom? <laughs> Twenty years, yeah. And there's a spirit I think that students still say today. Um, there, I've heard things like "Don't walk on the grass," you know, and there's a, there's a, people respect that. And also, everybody says hi. Everybody holds the door for you, and that's lasted for 20 years. And really, we've had. I know a professor who started, uh, I guess in 1969, he's, uh, and he told me that those traditions have, have continued for a long time. So Ian, any, other, any last questions before we sort of wrap up here or? Um, I was just wondering like, how, how does like the local history impact the courses? Because I mean, Springfield is a very historically important city with things ranging from like Shays Rebellion to at the college basketball. Yeah, so I mean, I can I could talk for the next two hours on this probably, and I'm sure Dr. Cardian could add in. But you know, I can't think of a class that I teach where local history isn't sort of prominent at some point in the semester. You know, like uh, I'm teaching an immigration history class right now. We talked today about the history of Italian immigration in Springfield at the turn of the 20th century, and so sort of the Italian language newspaper that was running in Springfield in, in 1913. This big festa that the Italian American community still has in Springfield to this day. Uh, so whether it's that, I mean, the civil war angles are just like, they're all over the place. Like, you know, I said, we, we go to a, a number of different places in Springfield, my civil war class. Um, Shays Rebellion, both, both Tom and I have gone to the armory to sort of learn about 
you know, the fact that it took place there, you know, and they have a really, they, uh, one time I went, they let us fire off like a, a musket from Shays Rebellion, uh, not, you know, from the rebellion, but a, a, a late 18th century model. So that was a, a highlight for the students that got to do that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's prominent in every class I teach, I'd say, because I think it's a great, you know, sort of immersive experience of history that you can't, you know, you, 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 you learn it differently, right? When you feel like you are kind of in it and a part of it in, in, in a sense, you know? Tom, anything else to add? Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I, as you said, it's very New England, very historical area, and we have the museums, but even the, the, um, the, 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 the campus itself has its history. The, the Massasoit, uh, Lake Massasoit or Watershops Pond there was, was built for the armory. So there's a, there's a connection that we have um, with the armory there because the water was used to power um, uh, equipment and, and the Connecticut River was, uh, was a place for us to, uh, in the early United States to bring in goods without being too close if an enemy would try to attack the armory itself. So yeah, thanks for the questions and you know, thank you all the students for your contributions as well. So Ian, I'll, uh, I'm going to put my email in the chat for anyone who's watching this. Uh, if you want to get in touch, uh, please shoot me an email uh, at that address. And uh, is it just T. Cardi, Tom? Yeah, yeah, you can put mine, T. Cardi at Springfield. Please be in touch, Ian, or, or again, anyone else watching this on recording. Uh, and you know, we'd be happy to put you in touch with any one of these uh, very helpful students that we have here with us, too. Um, Ian, thanks for joining us, and you know we hope to see you in the fall. Wait, and Professor. Oh, Sabrina, yes, yes, yes. I have one more thing. I was oh, going to forget good. all about it. I must promote the History Club yes. and use this time to do so. I got a quote from the very good, perfect president, Emily Gentile, um, <laughs> and she said that the History Club is a group of friends who like history and exploring stuff outside of class. And I think that kind of exemplifies what History Club is about because it really is a place where you can like build connections, which I think is very important, you know, with all the chaotic things are happening right now um, with the pandemic. And so you don't feel like you can, especially as like a freshman, feel like you can build those connections right now out of the gate because you are kind of in this box that is your dorm room and that is Zoom. And so this is an experience to kind of build those connections and also, you know, have those people have, again, a support system, in a sense, because that's what clubs are. They really are just an extension of, an, of a support system of people who have you know, similar interests as you do. And yeah, I just wanted to promote that real quick before we had to leave, join. Uh, you need new freshman members. We always need people. Thanks, Sabrina. All right, folks, I'm going to...